game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus, just back from Maui and our Love Serve Remember Foundation retreat in December. I think it was the seventh one. And we had, of course, Ramdas and Krishna Das and Jack Cornfield and his partner Trudy Goodman and my goddess of a wife, Saraswati Marcus, who led the yoga at the retreat. Also, let me not forget my, my, my own mother. She's like a mother to me, Mirabai Bush and Rameshwar Das, who led these incredible 6 a.m. Uh, medita incredible because he got up and actually did it. It was a spectacular event, everybody, and uh, it coincides me saying this, that just the other day, we opened up registration for the spring retreat. So I'm making a couple of announcements here before we get into Ram Dass's talk. And the spring retreat is Ram Dass, Krishna Dass, and Roshi Joan Halifax. Saraswati will be there again, as well as Mirabai Star. And whoever amongst you don't know who she is, check her out. She does. She's going to do a couple of few great workshops. And that is April 29th through May 5th. So go up to ramdas.org and check that out because these retreats, and this one's back in, in the same uh, resort that we do the December one it's at the Napili Kai, which is near Lahaina in Maui. And so we're going to have another extravaganza there. Do check it out. We'd love to have you. We'd also love to have you... Uh, if you haven't already, check out mindpodnetwork.com, which is uh, an aggregation of all of our family of teachers and friends uh, at uh, a destination podcast site. And that includes uh, what we do here, what I do here with Ram Dass, featuring his talks, as well as Mind Rolling Podcast, which I do with David Silver. It's a lot of fun. And Krishna Das, Jack Cornfield, and Sharon Salzberg. What one of our listeners, and we keep referring to, is our low hanging fruit friends. And uh, it's a beautiful site. It's got all sorts of other things aside from just the podcasts, which are fantastic, if I do say so. They also include wor wonderful wisdom. Uh, articles, videos, blogs uh, that uh, we'd love to share with you all. So go to mindpodnetwork.com and take advantage of it. And we'll, it's just brand new. It's really just a couple of months old. And we expect to uh, have many more really interesting podcasts and featured podcasts and uh, guest podcasts, so come aboard and give us your email address over there so we can keep informing you about good stuff that's going on. And also, appreciate the support for Love Server Member Foundation. This is the end of the year, 2014, and uh, we'd love to have you continue that support. And for any of you out there that want to make a donation before the end of the year to a 501c3 nonprofit, which you can get credit for in your tax return, please do so. We'll have a, a mailing going out reminding everybody about that, but go to ramdas.org and you can donate there. And by the way, I just did, uh, 
we did a film, David and I, uh, that came from some of these retreats called Cultivating Grace and Transforming Suffering. And it was just shown again at my wife Saraswati's uh, yoga center in Asheville, North Carolina. And I just want to say, I had seen this because I'd worked on it a bunch. And then I, of course, sat through with about 50, 60 people at this Christmas event on gratitude that she had. Nourishing Life is the name of the center, and you, you want to check it out online. And I, for those who haven't watched this particular film, it is so uh, insightful and incisive and transforming. I mean, again, I still got so many different messages after seeing this thing so many times. So I just... Uh, thought I'd mention it to everybody it's uh it, it's something I'd love to share and that's why we've been doing this stuff so here is a lecture about to play by Ramdas that's from actually 1976 in Washington and it's training to become nobody special is is the is the way he introduces it. And it's a piece of a lecture that uh, we picked out. And, and it's about, you know, you can be the biggest somebody in the world when nobody's home. And it's about tuning. Ramdas talks a lot about tuning. And I'm, music has been my love for my life. I have worked in it and out of it, uh, for in and out of it for many, many years. In fact, uh, as some of you know who listen to this podcast or the Mind Rolling, I met Ram Dass through my work as a program director of a rock and roll radio station back in the late 60s, or it was uh, 6970. And that's how I met Ram Dass. And so this... The idea here of tuning is something that is very dear to me and makes a lot of sense. Let me just uh, quote a couple of things here to give you an idea. The force of somebody-ness that develops the survival mechanisms, social and physical, it is the freedom of non-clinging to models about self and other that allows you to begin to tune to and hear the way of things called the Tao, which is the way. The way in which forms relate naturally, which is the divine law. The way in which you tune to the laws of the universe is not through your intellect. It's that tuning, and when you respect that tuning in yourself, actions that flow from you start to become dharmic, or in the way of things. They are acts that release beings from suffering and do not perpetuate the illusion. I find this particular part here where he says, Respect that tuning in yourself. I think that's crucially important for all of us because we have a hard time respecting that place which has to uh, start from an intuitive understanding that we are not our senses or our minds and egos. And once we get that tiny, you know, and it can be through psychedelics, we've talked about this before, once we get that tiny little connection, even the smallest connection, around the intuition and the knowing beyond mind that we are something that is a piece of the divine, and once we understand that, and we and I like the word respect that tuning in yourself, those words, because once we start to do that, 
we can really open up to what's around us and see, as he says, the way of things in which forms relate naturally. So uh, just love that. And I love the whole idea. I mean, I, to this day, I, I love kirtan and I do kirtan as a practice. And, and it's really that, that doing of kirtan tunes you in to your true self. So uh, that analogy is really wonderful. Let's see, what else does he say here? Uh, there's one thing around that takes it to a realm. When you are aware, uh, uh, when you are aware without clinging and in harmony with all the forces, you are no longer in time. When you are not in time and everything in the universe relates in a lawful way, but not in a way that's knowable by the intellect. Again, back to that. And you are in harmony with that law. You are in harmony with the way everything comes out so that you cannot act wrongly. And here's uh, what I was referring to. That is a level of consciousness in which social action that flows from it truly liberates humankind. For it is a level of awareness from which actions are manifest that have no clinging, not even clinging to the effects of the act. That is a central, powerful statement around social action. And I know David Silver and I in our Mind Rolling podcast, we just did one last week uh, around abundance and attachment that we talk about an awful lot, the whole us and them and how do we go about internal strategies to be able to change what we see as the um, complete ignorance of various politicians, social institutions, economic polarization, and so on and so forth, because we just react in such a knee-jerk fashion. And so again, we've talked a lot about it. This puts it into a very powerful, brief uh, statement of reality. Really good stuff. Um, there's one thing else that I wanted to just mention to point out, as I do in these podcasts around Ram Dass's talks. And, and it's a, it, once, let's say you have a moment, I and mean, everybody can relate with this. Maybe you get a moment where your judging mind is absent, or at least not as prominent. And you're not in your I, me, mine zone quite as much. You're more of an empty slate, just aware. And you walk down the street, and you're able to see things quite clearly. You see who everybody thinks they are. Everybody dresses and walks and looks and smiles or averts their eyes, as he says. And it's all in harmony of this model that they are holding on to of who they must be. Isn't that so? <laughs> It, boy, we all have done that, I'm sure. And then you, you, you set that reference out in the moments that you can see clearly, and you see what you yourself, you see what we ourselves do on a day-to-day -day basis to just uh, support these models of who we think we are. And again, back to, of course, the witness back to Ram Dass's current teaching around uh, loving awareness, from that place, we could really see this stuff, and we can see it in ourselves, and we can, once we do that, we have a chance to actually see it evaporate slowly, but surely, and inevitably. 
And last thing uh, I, I really love, because he says, because I so ad- identified with what other people wanted me to do as a way of demonstrating love, it was a long time before I understood that I cared enough about other human beings to be straight with them. And that straightness could be love. And I could say no without withdrawing that love. Another crucial point for human relationships, because we all do this. I know I do it. I have done it. And uh, getting some consciousness around this, that we can, there, it's, it's a leap of faith that you have to make that you know, somebody is not going to withdraw their love from you. And if they do, you have to absorb that. But you can say no with, with, without withdrawing that love when you do not expect anything in return, which is extraordinarily difficult and is called unconditional love. So some great stuff in this uh, talk around uh, becoming nobody special. So here we are, Ramdas, here and now, Nobody special. It's hard to understand the way in which all of us are in training to become nobody special. (laughs) And it is in that nobody specialness that we can be anybody. We can be the biggest somebodies in the world because there's nobody home. The fatigue, the neurosis, the anxiety, the fear all comes from identifying with the somebodyness. Who are you? It appears to be that you have to become, you have to be somebody to become nobody, to be somebody who is nobody. Let me try that again. (laughs) You have to start from somewhere. That if you started out being nobody at the beginning, of this incarnation, you probably wouldn't have made it this far. Blue babies are examples of nobody special. They just don't have the will to breathe or eat or live. For it's that force of somebodyness that develops the survival mechanisms, social and physical. And it is in the freedom of non-clinging to models about self and other that you begin to tune to and hear the way of things called the Tao, the way. The way in which forms relate lawfully not rational analytic law, but the natural law, the divine law. The law that includes paradox. And the way in which you tune to that law of the universe is not necessarily with your intellect. It's tuning at a more profound way of relating to the universe than even through your senses. And it's that tuning 
And when you respect that tuning mechanism in yourself, that the actions that flow from you start to be what is called dharmic or in the way of things or acts which release beings from suffering and do not perpetuate illusion. As long as you are in an incarnation, there will be action. As long as there is form, there will be change. But depending on who is doing the acting or who thinks who is doing the acting will determine whether that act is part of the flow of things or in opposition or antagonistic to it. It's like the story of the king's butcher. I think the story is written in Rep's book. And the king is a very fine butcher. And the king asked the butcher how he does it that although he has been cutting with the same knife for 19 years, it's never needed to be sharpened. And it turns out that what the butcher does is he is in tune with that which he is cutting. And the knife finds its way into the joint. It doesn't hit against the joint. It finds its way in around around the bone. And because he is tuned, not only he isn't busy being, I am a butcher cutting this piece of meat, he is awareness, and that awareness includes the meat and the butcher and the knife. And so there is an act happening, but there is no doer of the act because there's nobody that thinks he's a butcher. Or the king's music stand maker. And he makes incredibly music, beautiful music stands. And the king says to him, how do you make such incredibly beautiful music stands? The music stand maker says, there's nothing to it, sire. First, I fast for five days. until I forget that I am working for the king. Then I fast for another five days till I forget I'm a music stand maker. Then by then I am staggering through the woods and I come across a tree and in the tree is the music stand and I just clear away everything that isn't necessary. That is the level, that is the level at which awareness works. Because when you are aware without clinging and in harmony with all of the forces, you are no longer in time. Your body's in time, your thoughts are in time, your personality's in time, but you aren't. And when you are not in time, and everything in the universe interrelates in a lawful way, though not a law that is knowable by the intellect, and you are in harmony with that law, 
you are in harmony the way, with the way everything comes out and everything that preceded it so that you cannot act wrongly. For not only are you in tune with the particular act you're doing in terms of time, but the gestalt, all of the ways in which that act is interrelated with everything in the universe. That is a level of consciousness in which social action that flows from it truly liberates humankind. For it is a level of awareness from which actions are manifest that have no clinging. Not even clinging to the effects of the act. You can work with all of your energy and total one-pointedness towards bringing about an end you have done all you can do at any moment. It is total involvement. And it doesn't happen at the end. And at the moment it doesn't happen, you are right here now. You're not holding on with despair or anger or frustration. That's then. You're right here. The new existential moment is now. It's always the beginning of things, always. Don Juan says, no personal history. You keep giving up your storyline. You have it. It's there. You can write about it. You can keep a diary of it. But you don't cling to it. Because every time you walk into a situation and you have a model of who you are or who you aren't, stops the flow. I never dance. I'm brahmacharya. I love dope all the time. I love dope. Yeah. I'm a responsible person. <laughs> I'm a mother. I'm a seeker. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I'm dependent. It's interesting when you're just aware and you walk down the street because you see too much. Because you see who everybody thinks they are. Because <laughs> everybody dresses and walks and looks and smiles or averts their eyes in harmony with this model they're holding on to of who they must be. night before last I was doing a television show with a fellow interviewing me and he started the interview by saying whatever it is you are I want how do I get it 
<laughs> she was right out front. Right? So I said to her, well, why don't you stop being who you think you are? And we looked into each other's eyes, and we saw interviewer, interviewee. He was busy being Patrick, and I was Ram Dass. And slowly, all these roles just kept becoming passing show. And here we were, and the television cameras were grinding away. And he was getting higher and higher and lighter and farther out. And I said, you can go as high as you want, but don't forget you're an interviewer. You can keep the game going. You don't have to be in it. You can just play it, you know, you can keep doing it. You don't have to blow your scene which is all on the television camera. <laughs> and then he said, I don't understand what's happening. He says, this is weird. He says, I, I love you, and I couldn't possibly love you. I don't even know you. You're a man. It's impossible. <laughs> you see the problem. I mean, all of our social, cultural bloops are based on thinking everybody's somebody doing something, right? When you fall in love with somebody, what are you supposed to do? Love is so far out, there's this flow. It's not the word love is, you know, we've got an awful lot of overload meaning to it. Making love, falling in love, we love each other, the whole romantics, poetic metaphor of love. But that romantic one is like, I fell in love with her or him, meaning she or he turns me on to the place in myself where I am love. And I can't get there other than through my connection which is her or him. And I get attached to my method. <laughs> my method of getting high, of being in love. So I want to have my method with me all the time, my mala beads, my beloved, I call it. And the thought that my beloved might split is a little bit freaky, so that I want to possess my beloved. So romantic poetry often has in it jealousy and even hatred. But can you imagine when that place you've only touched through your methods, you become? You are love you finally acknowledged who you are. And you've cleared away all the mind trips that keep you from being who you are. So you just are it. Now, everybody you look at, you're in love with. What do you do about it? <laughs> I mean, maybe two. Three, but it's absurd. I mean, the least you want to do is go up to somebody and say, I love you. you know, we tried that for a long time. But it's even out of hand. I mean, it's way beyond that one. Because you can't do it to policemen and, you know, people you're just passing in the street. You can't do it. It's just not done. Then you see the exquisiteness of the predicament of being in love with everybody and there's nothing that has to be done about it. Because you've developed compassion. Compassion to let people be as they need to be without coming on to them. And the only time you come on to people are when their actions are limiting 
the opportunities for other human beings to be free. And then the way in which you come on is critical. For if you are somebody coming on, forget it. You're just creating more anger. If you are nobody special, but it is your dharma to come on about injustice, then it is merely a pure act of the dharma. And not for a moment do you forget that you love the other person totally. It's interesting to separate out the space in which we love, we are love, we merge in love, from the yeses and nos of life. To be able to say no to somebody without withdrawing love, It took me a long, long time because I so identified doing what other people wanted me to do as a way of demonstrating love. It was a long time before I understood that I cared enough about other human beings to be straight with them and that straightness could be love and I could say no without withdrawing that love. That's a big one. For the love is not on the domain of social relationship. And that awareness that I was talking about earlier and the love I'm talking about now are the same thing because what we're talking about has no labels. These are just ways that you can approach it intuitively through what you know about love, through what you know about awareness. It brings you into, ah, love, awareness, energy. In a few minutes, we'll talk about energy. Shakti, Kundalini, just another set, another strategy, another set of methods. Radha falls in love with Krishna. The love of fear goes on and on and on and on until lover and beloved merge. Is the merging Sexual, perhaps. It may be sexual, but it's not lustful because lust keeps somebody separate. Once you hear even the beginning of what it is we are speaking about, your whole life becomes oriented towards the becoming of it. And ultimately, every act of your life becomes a vehicle of becoming aware. It's all method. Once you understand what awakening is about, once you understand what a human incarnation is, once you have that little philosophical base, the meaning of life changes. Then the whole pleasure principle is seen in perspective. 
sure you enjoy pleasure and you avoid pain, but you are no longer the enjoyer or the avoider. There is pleasure and there is pain. I recall sitting with someone dying and their body was writhing in pain and I was meditating by the bed and the meditation got deeper and deeper and the being turned to me because we were merging in this space way beyond this plane or deeper than this plane or around or in the space surrounding the pain. And she said to me, I am feeling the deepest peace I ever felt in my life. All the time, her body was writhing in pain. I said, is there pain? She says, yes, there is pain. But the pain was in the context of the space. So she was not somebody who was being pained. Pleasure, pain. the other parts of that little image of what a person who is free is free of in polarities. Pleasure, pain, loss, gain. Ah, there's loss. Ah, there's gain. Fame, shame. Birth, death, ah, I'm alive, hmm, strange, I'm dead. For awareness has nothing to do with dying. All that dies is that which is in time. You're not going anywhere. You're just attached to that which is going somewhere, mainly into dust. But in awareness, in love, in truth, we are. We are, which includes were and will be. what to do. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.